Um, the session today, so we have about 25 minutes, um, I want to cover uh, some, um, some ideas around how to build a case for inner source. This is, uh, you know, a lot of people tell us why, why should we be doing this? And, and so um, uh, how do you pitch that to your management? How do you explain why it makes sense? Because inner source involves sometimes, actually all, often, um, culture change that, uh, that takes time to, to happen and, and takes energy and resources to make happen. So, so you'll have to do some convincing um, if you want to get the, the most out of inner source. We'll cover that in the, in the session today. So, um, so first we'll start by um, defining um, what is inner source and, and inner source comments has a great definition. I'm going to use one that is slightly different and you'll see from the wording, um, but uh, because it's, it's a, a more of a, a, a academic uh, definition, um, which I, I like as well, then we'll talk about a little bit of who's doing it. And those are really two introduction slides. And then most, the biggest part of the presentation will be on the benefits, which is what you need to talk about to your management. And then um, one slide on kind of next steps and, and, and how to go about it. So first of all, um, I have a definition of uh, of what is inner source, and uh, and it comes from a research paper, which is nice. Um, and then you, you notice the spelling, which is not the same as inner source commons, but we're really talking about the same thing. Um, inner source is the use of open source software development practices and the establishment of an open source like culture, and this is important within organizations. So you know what it means is that we're we're trying to do everything like the open source world has been doing for a bunch of years or decades, um, but we're keeping this inside the organization for whatever reasons. It could be because we don't want to share our code um, uh, with others because it doesn't, you know, mandate being shared. Sometimes it's your, your core IP. Um, you don't want to share it. Um, sometimes it's because you don't think it makes sense for others to use it or because you might just be piloting uh, these methodologies and best practices before going full open source. So there's a whole bunch of reasons why companies do um, inner source. Um, but in here, what we're doing is looking at doing the implementing these methodologies, these best practices, this culture inside the organization. By the way, this paper is really interesting. If you want to have a look at it, um, it was written by some uh, some some really people around there, um, and has some some pretty interesting facts. So what we're talking here uh, with inner source, we're going to be talking about culture, methodology, tools. Okay. So uh, next step is who's actually doing inner source. And I say I use doing. In a very general way because it's it's uh, you know it's it's consuming inside the organization it's developing it's sharing code among teams and developers so it's it's it, it's doing in a very large sense um 16 percent of organizations have inner source initiatives that's not a lot and and by the way inner source initiative that they identify as, as such so there's you know there's there was a um, a survey that was done in 2022, so it's recent enough. And organizations have been asked, you know, do they have inner source act initiatives? The strange thing or funny thing, or however you want to say it, is that companies, when you talk to them and you understand what they're actually doing, some of them are actually doing something that looks a lot like inner source. They haven't called it that way because either they're not aware of what inner source is, or they don't think that it's close enough to inner source definition that it should be called inner source. But in effect, you know, they're, they're sharing some code, they're, uh, they're letting people update the code and things like that. So it, it, it should actually be, I think it's bigger than 16%. Um, but, um, but the actual answer is not easy to find out because companies don't necessarily realize they're doing inner source. It touches every organization, or every vertical uh, in the industry, right? Financial services are doing inner source. Automotive is doing inner source. Telcos are doing inner source. You name it, they're all doing inner source. Um, and so, so whatever your organization uh, is working in, you have the possibility to do inner source. There's no no, no blocking uh, factor uh, for inner source. It might limit some of the things you're sharing, um, some of the, uh, the the types of code you're sharing. But, uh, but keep in mind that you can implement inner source just about in any kind of organization. And so at Wipro, we've been doing a lot of assessments around inner source and open source strategy. And, and so we've assessed a lot of these companies on their inner source strategy or their open source strategy sometimes. And so, uh, you know, as, uh, as I like to say, uh, this is uh, this presentation. Well, here are their stories. Aha, I've been dreaming of doing that sound. So. 
let's look now at um, at the various benefits that people have been uh, finding from doing open source, uh, inner source, sorry. The first one I've seen, um, the most commonly used I've seen is code reuse. I put this one first because it's the one I like less. So let, let that sink in. If you're doing inner source for code reuse, be aware that I don't like that. <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's a metric, but it doesn't really mean much. That's the problem with saying we're doing a lot of code reuse thanks to inner source. What does code reuse bring you? That's what you really want to look at. If you're doing inner source just for code reuse, you're missing a good part of the interest of doing inner source. So, you know, let's let's look at what code reuse brings, right? The actual derived benefits of code reuse are often more important um, when you know what you're looking for than just measuring code reuse. Yeah, for example, are you reducing your development cost because you're reusing existing code? Are you making your development faster? Because since you're reusing, you're reusing code, you, have, you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. Um, is your code quality increasing? Because when you reuse code and you fix it or enhance it, it becomes better over time and you're using better and better code. Are you fostering inner team collaboration, um, which has benefits of itself because you're reusing other teams' code? So if you're measuring code reuse, um, you know, and, and, I, and that'll be part of my uh, conclusion slides as well. If you're measuring code reuse, think about it. What is it actually that it brings you and why do you think code reuse helps your organization? And stop measuring code reuse, measure what it actually brings. Now, um, innovation is something that is really, really interesting uh, when we're looking at inner source. It's almost, as with open source, probably the most important benefit you get from, from inner source. Why? Because when you're sharing ideas, when you're spreading ideas, when you're using other people's ideas into your code, you're basically integrating into your code, you know, ideas, cult el cultural elements uh, from other teams, other cultures, other countries, their companies who are doing inner source across countries, which poses some other kinds of, um, of issues. Um, there's a, an automotive vendor that's doing inner source, and I, since this is the recorded part, not the Chatham House, so I'm not going to name them. Um, there's an automotive vendor that's doing inner source and it has all kinds of issues trying to figure out how you tax each piece of code that gets shipped into a car because uh, VAT depends on where the stuff has been developed, where the value has been developed. So it can be tricky, but it, it usually works really well, especially in terms of innovation. So think about it. When your teams are spread across the world, when your teams are diverse for any kind of reason, um, you're benefiting from all that by doing inner source because they're all working together and all looking at things with maybe a slightly different perspective. Um, so innovation. If, you're, if you have an innovation uh, strategy, make sure... Um, you talk to the innovation people um, to about inner source, about how that can help them um, uh, drive that creativity that they're looking for. <laughs> and one of the, the actual uh, cultural aspects is that, you know, uh, you have to step away from the not invented here syndrome, which usually affects middle management that's saying, oh, my team has developed something that is really good. And and, uh, and and it's always like that. So when we're creating something new, we're going to create it from scratch because we're used to making the best stuff and, and nobody else does it better than we do. So um, so make sure that, you know, you need to uh, uh, to get away from that uh, that that uh, that syndrome and not invent it here actually helps. It helps because it brings everybody else's ideas to your team. So innovate. Talent retention. Uh, and I like this little quote that I found on the internet. The first thing our new hire did was fix a bug that's been bugging him forever as a user prior to joining. And then he breathed a sigh of relief and submitted his two weeks notice. What the fuck? So that's the thing, you know, when you hire a developer, they have reasons for coming in. Um, and, and attracting them uh, is, is, you know, is, is leveraging those reasons in your communication. But once they're in here, uh, you want to make sure they stay. They stay for you know a long time because it's an investment re, um, uh, recruiting people. It's an investment that uh, uh, in money and time and people, etc. And then in training once they're they're on board. So you hire them and then you bring them uh, uh, the kind of environment they're looking for. Since the best developers tend to be open source from the outside, let them work internally the same way. 
let him, you know, share their knowledge, let him work in, you know, uh, across the organization, let him, uh, you know, fix other people's code. They, if they, they find bugs, let them do it. Um, let them explain what they're doing. Let their knowledge be shared across. Uh, they, they love that. And it's because it's rewarding when you're inside an organization and, and people know that you're the person who actually developed this really cool uh, library that everybody else is using. Um, that's that's uh, super motivating. So so bring them this environment internally. If you're not doing open source, but you're doing inner source, that's great. Uh, people love it. Um, you know, listen to these developers. Um, if uh, there, there's a company right now that's actually putting in place Linux development environment to bank, Linux development environment for their developers because they realize that the developers want it, and since they want to keep their developers. Um, you know, they're, they've listened to them and they're, they're creating this new development platform based on Linux laptops. Make your developers happy. Bring them internally all the kind of tools and environments they're, they're looking for. That's a great way to help them stay in addition to attracting them. And by the way, the attraction is, could be as simple as communicating on your inner source program externally. You know, do podcasts, explain, do what we're doing right now, you know, presentations in, in organizations like Intersource Commons or elsewhere, um, and, uh, and talk about your Intersource um, activities. That is a green flag for a developer. Um, developer skills, that's a really nice benefit from Intersource. Every time people share, they learn, right? The fact that you publish or share your code, you get feedback. Um, people also learn from your code. They read high quality code. They find bugs, they fix them. Fixing a bug is sometimes a great way to start being a, an actual coder because fixing a bug that's bothering you can, you know, if, if, if you're smart and you don't necessarily know programming, uh, you, it, it doesn't take a lot to find out how to fix a code and, and, and do that. And then you, you, you get into programming and start writing bigger pieces of code. Um, I've, I've done that. I, the, the first time I con contributed to, a, to an, a, an actual open source code at the time, there was no inner source. Um, it, I didn't really know how to program. I just found a bug and I looked into source code and it looked strange. So I learned what that instructions mean and, and fixed it. Um, so, and getting feedback, when you share your code, you get feedback from people. And sometimes it's, it's harsh in the organization, in the inner source space, it's a lot less harsh usually than, than the open source because, you know, people want to keep their jobs. Um, so they're not going to insult you on your code, but it's still, you're going to get feedback. People are going to tell you what, you know, they think could be enhanced if they're nice, fixed if they're not as nice. Um, and so you learn a lot. So developers actually, um, get uh, get a lot of uh, value out of sharing their code uh, and using uh, somebody else's uh, code that has been shared. Um, creating communities is great because that's a, a super tool for, for people to share their knowledge. And, and every time such a tool is put in place inside an organization, it actually um, works well. People talk about, that's what we've noticed. Um, people talk about what they've been doing. People, you know, explain, uh, people are, people are really happy actually to talk about their stuff. It's surprisingly enough, it, while it takes time, they're really happy, uh, to, to do that. So, so leverage it, you know, give them something that makes them happy. And that as a benefit brings a lot of value to your organization. Um, code quality is, is, a is a good benefit. It's, uh, it's easy to measure. There are metrics for that, you know, number of bugs uh, per thousand lines of code or whatever. And, and, and it, it works well because it, the more you have people who are using code um, in their applications, the more they have a chance of finding bugs. Um, and, and of course, you know, if you have an inner source uh, model, people will actually fix the bugs they find rather than wait for somebody else to have time to fix it. So. People fix things at the moment they need them fixed rather than waiting for, you know, whoever developed that library internally uh, gets around to fixing that bug because they have other fires to, to stop. Um, and so, so what happens is that also, instead of having this, you know, develop code review publish model, um, since everybody is, re is using your code all the time, the code review becomes kind of a streamlined process throughout the life cycle of the, uh, of the application. It's not just a one-time code review. It's every time somebody's going to use your code, there's a code review happening. It's not as extensive. It's not complete. Um, but 
every time they find a bug, they're going to go to look back into your code and, and fix something that you might have skipped during your own code review. So, so that I like to say that the code review becomes streamlined, part of the life cycle of the uh, uh, of the uh, the development, kind of like a CI/CD environment, but not really. It's just kind of a native benefit of of inner source, which is nice. Um, and uh, the 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 last one I have actually is time to functionality. So time to functionality means that because people are reusing code, see, see that's a benefit of code reuse here, right there. Um, but again, you're not measuring, you don't want to measure code reuse. You want to measure the benefit, like time to functionality. People are reusing code means they don't need to spend as much time developing it and even less debugging it. They only, it's been debugged already. And if they find a bug, they'll just focus on that one because that one's hurting them. They don't have to do the full you know, um, bug fix, bug review thing. Um, and and that that uh, that works both for internally developed code, whether you know you're writing code inside your organization that you're using for whatever purpose inside, or products that you're developing. When you're uh, an automotive vendor and you're including a piece of code that manages, I don't know, the um, the battery um, um, pre-charging of your uh, electrical vehicle, it's probably been developed by another team that uh, that has the battery. Uh, in, in another type of vehicle. And so <clears throat> that code has been debugged and, and, and already fixed. So when you're going to be using that library, that's so much time you're, uh, you're, uh, you're saving on, on implementing that new car. Um, and, and also uh, one thing that you can use for, for uh, increasing your time to functionality is using things like hackathons or other type of internal uh, challenges um, um, I don't know, um, not bug bounties here, but code bounties and, uh, and, and asking people who have some spare time on their hand maybe uh, to, to work on code that you need uh, rather than have your team doing it all by themselves, you know, use other teams in the organization. And these teams will actually uh, participate even more if they also see an interest in developing that code for their future use. So getting back to the battery uh, example that I mentioned earlier, um, you know, if you say we're, we're going to be integrating a battery in, into this new generation of, uh, of electrical vehicle, uh, who wants to, to, to participate in writing you know, battery uh, charge uh, management or pre-charge conditioning libraries, um, somebody else from another team that's also looking at maybe building a different model of car for a different market or truck or whatever, um, might might join the fun and say, "Oh well, yeah, wait, we're we're looking for something like that. Let's let's all work together and and see who gets there first and and share our results." So so think about it. Um, I've seen uh, uh, banks in particular um, organize hackathons. Automotive vendors definitely um, organize hackathons uh, for exactly that kind of purpose. So you know they they have a theme. They focus on developing code for doing X or Y or Z, and everybody works on it. Uh, so. So those are all, you know, those hackathons are definitely very inside the inner source type of culture where teams from all around share code. And when you do that, just keep something in mind. Don't stop at the end of the hackathon. The result of the hackathon uh, should be code that's made available as inner source library for everybody else in the organization, even those who didn't participate, right? You're doing this for you, but others will benefit, which means your organization, the whole organization will benefit. So, so great tool, use it to, uh, to the maximum, not just for, you know, developing a library and then making that uh, sleep somewhere. So uh, um, my last and final slide um, will be on some ideas for next steps and, and, and some, some suggestions to leverage all the benefits that I've mentioned earlier. So, so the first one is, you know, um, define your goals properly for inner source. It's very easy to have uh, to have metrics. There, there's a whole bunch of them, and you can look them up. There's organizations that publish them. Chaos has some interesting ones for inner source, and and, and you name it. They, they all have. There's a whole bunch of metrics. The question is, which ones actually make sense? I'll get back to using the same uh, same one for as before. You know, code reuse. That's an easy metric, but what does it really mean? 
why are you measuring code reuse? Uh, what does it bring you? So, so some examples of, of metrics that I've listed here. If you're, if you're looking at, for example, driving innovation, you know, number of new ideas coming out of the inner source projects, that's, that's a metric for innovation. If, if you have a core objective to be like one of the insurance companies I talked to in uh, Australia, which had their mission was to be the most user focused and innovative insurance company in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, they have innovation in their uh, core mission. So here having an innovation metric makes sense because it's their mission to be innovative. So number of new ideas coming out of the inner source project. Um, code quality. If if you if one of your objectives is increasing the code quality because you've been struggling with bugs and things like that, you know you could measure, for example, the ratio of time spent fixing reported bugs versus developing code. The more you're spending time fixing bugs, you know, probably good a good idea to reduce that. Um, if if you want to implement a community, which is not an end goal in itself, but it could be a, goal, a temporary goal to get to something else, right? So you want to develop a, de a community cultures culture. So you'll set some goals for community, like number of projects available as inner source repositories. You want to grow that. Number of developers participating in inner source communities. You want to grow that. And, and you can have that as a as a, a temporary, you know, kind of getting there um, uh, objective with associated metrics. And once you have that culture in place, it tends to run by itself in the sense that you'll have to keep, you know, the fire kindled, but you 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 might not need to measure it as much. Um, keep track of it, but not make that a, a key objective. So that would be a temporary type of goal. And then another thing that's really important is is education and training. Right, um, it changing the culture to an inner source culture takes time. It's not going to happen overnight. It's probably not going to happen over a quarter. Um, you're lucky if in a year you get to where you want. Um, but it's worth it. So to, to take the time to do it, get ready, you know, uh, get a good seat, sit down, do it, watch the results, train your middle management. They're the most often uh, mentioned and, and uh, observed, uh, um, how do you say, uh, issue with developing inner source because the middle management feels very often mistakenly that having another team participate uh, in their code makes them lose control or whatever, or lose the visibility or whatever. No, what you need to understand is that if, if your team is developing a piece of code and you're allowing other as organizations, um, teams in the organization to work on it, um, you actually gain invisibility. So inside your organization, your code will become the reference uh, for doing something and because it's become the reference, your team will get the visibility. You have other developers participating in, but do it well, and you're the one who are actually winning from it. So, but the middle management doesn't always see that. They see that, that they're losing the control on, the, on their code. They, they think that because others are doing it, the others are gonna get the credit. Um, it's, it's not like that, so, so, but they need to be trained and, and it, it can take some time, so do that. Um, and finally, um, another one that, that I like a, uh, a lot, and, and it's, it's not easy. Uh, I don't know how many of you have heard of uh, neuro-linguistic programming. It's a, it's, a, it's a series of tools that can be seen as either uh, mumbo jumbo or uh, uh, some uh, more seriously. But if, if you adapt the vocabulary you use to your management's vocabulary, then you have a better chance of convincing them. So. You know, developers will talk in a certain way. And if you have a community manager, they need to talk like a developer. But even if you're a developer or a developer turned manager, when you're going to talk to your management, you need to talk in their language. If you're going to talk to the HR people, you know, uh, talk about talent acquisition and retention. That's something HR people love. Uh, if you're talking to, uh, to the risk people, use vocabulary uh, like risk appetite or words like that, uh, that they understand and they relate to. If you're going to talk to, talk to, uh, to your financial people, uh, you know, don't talk to them about uh, uh, cost, talk to them about uh, OPEX and CAPEX, or you know, use vocabulary that they, they can relate to because it, it makes them more, um, uh, more willing to 
listen and more capable of understanding. Now, there's a trick that I that I learned when I started uh, learning NLP. And I'll, I'll finish on the NLP with that. Um, you know, if if you're talking to somebody and every time they answer, they see things like, "Yeah, I see what you mean. I see." That means that they're a visual person. So don't talk to them about uh, auditory images. You know, uh, listen to to what I'm saying. If you say if you're if you say listen to what I'm saying to somebody who keeps saying, I see what you mean, they won't listen. They, they, they don't work that way. So you have to say, you know, like, look at the big picture and they'll listen to that part, strangely enough, and vice versa. So, so, um, so keep that in mind when you're talking to your management, use words, use phrases, uh, use images, images. Yeah, I'm a visual person, I'm a photographer, um, that, uh, that they will understand um, and, and relate to, and that make it easier to convince them to go the way you want to. And remember, and I'll close on this one. Um, remember, you know, it's also okay if you don't call it inner source. Uh, if as long as you're sharing code internally and you're helping your teams uh, by letting them participate in the development of the code, even if you're not calling it inner source with or without a space between inner and source, of course, here we don't have the space, um, it's still okay. And, and maybe that 16% that I mentioned at the beginning of my uh, presentation um, will turn into 20 or 25 because people realize that what they're doing um, is not necessarily called inner source today, but it really looks a lot like it, you know? And if it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, chances are it's a duck. Thank you very much.